The scripture reading this morning is taken from the book of Exodus. First, I will read uh, from chapter 6. The first is uh, 2 to 12. And then the chapter 7, the verses 1 to 13. God also said to Moses, I am the Lord. I appear to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself fully known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, where they resided as foreigners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the Israelites, whom the Egyptians are enslaving, and I have remembered my covenant. Therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God, who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. And I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. Moses reported this to the Israelites, but they did not listen to him because of their discouragement and harsh labor. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go, tell Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, to let the Israelites go out of his country. But Moses said to the Lord, If the Israelites will not listen to me, why would Pharaoh listen to me, since I speak with faltering lips? Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron will be your prophet. You are to say everything I command you, and your brother Aaron is to tell Pharaoh to let the Israelites go out of his country. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and though I multiply my signs and wonders in Egypt, he will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt, and with mighty acts of judgment, I will bring out my divisions, my people, the Israelites. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out of it. Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord commanded them. Moses was 80 years old and Aaron 83 when they spoke to Pharaoh. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, when Pharaoh says to you, perform a miracle, then say to Aaron, take your staff and throw it down before Pharaoh and it will become a snake. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron threw his staff down in front of Pharaoh and his officials and it became a snake. Pharaoh then summoned wise men and sorcerers and the Egyptian magicians also did the same things by their secret arts. Each one threw down the, his staff and it became a snake. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs Yet Pharaoh's heart became hard, and he would not listen to them, just as the Lord had said. This is the word of the Lord. So when I preached a couple of weeks ago, I, I said that one of the ways to think about God's work in both the Old and New Testaments is this. God seeks to bring strangers into relationship with God and make them part of God's people. And we here, we talk a lot about having a relationship, a personal relationship with God in Christ. And yet it, it must be said that often those in the Bible that have the closest relationships with God don't seem to enjoy it very much. Perhaps no one in the Old Testament had a closer relationship with God than Moses. But frankly, Moses seems to experience it as more of a burden than as a joy. When God comes calling, Moses isn't delighted to hear him. He's like, you know, he, he kind of shirks away. He wants to hide. You get the feeling sometimes that he'd prefer to get out of this if he could. And the prophets are often like that too. God, I don't want to do this. Uh, could you go ask somebody else? And so far, listening to God 
has only made his life and the lives of his people more difficult. That's where we are in the story. So Moses needs some encouragement. And in chapter six, God says that he's never revealed himself to anyone before the way that he's revealed himself to Moses. No one knows God like Moses does. Not even Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob knew God's name. And that might not seem like a big detail to us, but it is a big deal. Sharing names, uh, even in our uh, relationships, it closes the distance between people. Uh, it, it establishes a, a sort of uh, relationship, a sort of uh, level ground. It makes you somewhat more vulnerable and intimate with the other person. God wants to emphasize that he's personally invested and that he's not far removed from the cries of his people. He hasn't forgotten his covenant. And then, as we read, God gives Moses a stirring message to proclaim, a message full of action verbs, which emphasize the many things that God is going to do for the Israelites. He says, I, I will free you from oppression. I will rescue you from slavery. I will redeem you with a powerful arm. I will claim you as my own people, and I will be your God then you will know that I am the Lord your God who has freed you from your oppression in Egypt. I will bring you into the land I swore to give Abraham and Isaac to Jacob. I will give it to you as your very own possession. I am the Lord. And isn't this exactly what we would imagine that the people would want to hear? And this is great news. These people are enslaved. And here is God saying, I want to set you free. And not only that, I want to lift you up and give you your own land, and I'm going to be in relationship with you and be your God. This is fantastic news. And yet, when God, uh, when Moses brings God's message, the people weren't interested in listening to it, or, or perhaps it's better to say they just really couldn't hear it. Moses takes this personally, as people tend to do, he concludes that it's because of his clumsy speech. But the passage tells us that the Hebrews couldn't believe because their spirits were broken. They were discouraged by the oppression they suffered. Their slavery had beaten them down to the point that they just couldn't really believe. And their lives had only gotten worse since Moses started talking about this God who wanted to free them. Their entire lives had been spent in bondage. They'd never had any reason to be hopeful, any reason to believe that their oppression would ever end, perhaps not even really all that much reason to believe that there was a God who could set them free. This is just the way things were. They were so beaten down that they couldn't hear the good news. The seed fell on stony ground. The reality, I think, is that our ability to receive the good news depends largely upon our life circumstances and the culture and situation in which we find ourselves. It's no coincidence, for instance, that, that many of us here, I assume safely, I think, uh, probably had Christian parents and grew up in church. Certainly not all of us but probably most of us. From the very start, we were formed in ways that made reception of the good news possible. And we'd probably even started receiving that good news and taking it in before we even realized what was happening, before we even knew that we had a choice in the matter. For those of us who first heard the good news later in life, it's still the case that our experiences, both good and bad, prepared the soil on which that seed would fall. And all of us, whatever our story, have experienced things that make hearing the good news difficult, that make it hard for us to really listen and hear and believe what God has to say. Could these things really be true? Why one person hears the message and believes and another person doesn't is a mystery. 
why do you believe and your brother doesn't? Who knows? It's a really hard question to answer. It's not a question for us probably to answer. And you may have noticed that we live in a world in which the conditions for the reception of the good news seem increasingly inhospitable, if not hostile. And in our culture and place, this isn't so much because we suffer oppression like the Hebrews. We're not oppressed by others. If anything, we suffer a kind of self-oppression. Despite our freedom, or perhaps rather exactly because of our freedom, we have become people who are subject to the tyranny of ourselves, whose lives are directed entirely to the satisfaction of our own desires. And this is what people believe in. And this pursuit is not finally just dissatisfying, but it's ultimately despairing. For eventually, at some point, we realize that if we live this way, our lives are not oriented to any reality, any authority, any goal beyond ourselves, which is to say that modern people, in so many ways, quite literally believe in nothing. Cynicism abounds. And I wonder if there's ever been a less hopeful age. It is hope that sustains us. Hope that makes it possible to really hear the good news. But those who are convinced there's no reason to hope find it hard to listen. And there is, of course, another character in this story, a pretty major character, who finds it difficult to hear what God would say, but for different reasons. Pharaoh rejects God's message without a thought because he thinks he's the center of the universe. He's Pharaoh, after all. I mean, the, the world orbits around him. Why would he take orders from some upstart God? And even if this God is the God of the Hebrews, as he claims, well, that's not so much to brag about, is it? Like most men in power, Pharaoh was consumed with keeping his power and expanding his power, which meant that setting the Israelites free, as Moses demanded, was just really a non-starter. Why would he do that? God's intentions ran counter to Pharaoh's interests. And it's not like he lived in a time when people were really much concerned with the plight of slaves. I mean, you, you couldn't really make the moral appeal. Uh, you know, Pharaoh, it's really bad what you're doing here. I mean, everyone just assumed this is the way that the world was. This was just the natural order of things. When God shows up saying, well, you should uh, set them free, God's, Pharaoh's thinking, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Who is this God? Pharaoh could only see and hear what he had the desire to see and hear. As a bit of an aside, and I'll deal with this more next week, the trouble, of course, is that Scripture speaks of God hardening Pharaoh's heart, which, of course, raises all kinds of questions. Again, questions I'm not going to try to answer, certainly not this week, and I don't expect to answer them maybe next week either, but I'll try. But for now, it's worth noting that these chapters... Uh, beginning now and following, present Pharaoh as a very willing and active participant in his own heart hardening. It's not like Pharaoh had a soft heart and a gentle spirit before God started meddling in his inner life. God can be said to harden Pharaoh's heart exactly because Pharaoh has always been the kind of man whose heart hardens in response to God. So it's strange then that this God, this Pharaoh, would ask uh, for a, a sign, a wonder, as if from Moses and Aaron, like he, he really wants uh, to know something. He really wants to see something special. Um, God anticipates this, but like most people who ask for wonders, um, it's a bit cynical, usually. He wants to see a trick. And so, God tells Moses and Aaron, you know, when you're in Pharaoh's presence, throw down your staff and it'll become a snake. And they do this. 
uh, Aaron throws down the staff, staff and it becomes a snake. And, and you might think that Pharaoh would be impressed. I've never seen anything like that. But what's Pharaoh do? Well, he goes and calls his magicians. Uh, he wants to explain it away. There must be some other reason. And when the magicians do end up making their own snake, Pharaoh concludes, well, there's no power here that I don't already have control over. I, clearly, I, 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 you know, this God isn't doing anything I haven't seen before, so not anything I need to worry about. But of course, what happens is, in which Pharaoh seems not to even notice, at least the, the passage doesn't say anything, is that uh, Aaron's staff swallows up the other ones uh, in much the same way that the Egyptians will be swallowed in the Red Sea. But Pharaoh, as a perfect cynic that he is, cannot make meaning from his own experience. Now, we might like to think that if we were there, that if we saw miracles that you know, we, we would understand, we would respond appropriately. Uh, but the Bible is, is full of, of stories of people who see and hear and they just don't get it. And the Israelites themselves, they're gonna experience all of these plagues. Uh, they're gonna pass through the Red Sea and then the minute Moses goes missing, they're like, well, I guess this God abandoned us. We need to make a golden calf now. I mean, they just, they forget everything. Uh, in Jesus' own time, he performs miracles, and, and the authorities, they see these miracles, uh, but you know, they, they don't believe. They see it as a threat to their power, something they need to press down. They see it as more in terms of what they stand to lose and what they stand to gain. And even those that saw Jesus do what he did, uh, the miracles that he performed, they they were apparently quite interested. They followed him for a while, but then when things go bad and Jesus is on the cross, the truth is quite literally on display and no one is there to see it because they've given up. People tend to see what they're prepared to see. And so also in the gospel, the, the devil tempts Jesus three times to do something spectacular that'll convince the people. And that's what those, those temptations are, are all really about. Jesus, do something amazing and people will love you. And we, we think like, yeah, that's what God ought to do. But that's a temptation that Jesus re rejects. Later, the Pharisees and Sadducees will come asking for a sign Jesus told them, an adulterous and evil generation asked for a sign. Like, oh, really? I thought I would like a sign. I mean, does, that, does that mean I'm may, maybe more like the Pharisees and Sadducees than I think? We often think we know what we need, but maybe we don't as much as we would like to think. So what will move people then who find it hard to hear? What about those who are beaten down, whose spirits are crushed, who have forgotten what hope is, who don't even dare to hope? And what will soften the hearts of those who have hardened themselves to a world without meaning, whose cynicism is the only defense against harsh realities? Oddly enough, and maybe it's not quite as exciting as you would like, the answer in the Exodus story and in the New Testament is the people of God. That is the answer. Part of the promise God makes is not just to free the people, but to make them into a people, his people, and be their God. Again, God seeks to bring strangers into relationship with God and make them part of God's people. And as the story unfolds, and as the Israelites come to know who God is, and as they receive his commands and obey them sporadically, 
And as they repeatedly turn from and return to God, they become people who, however imperfectly, reflect who God is to the world. And this reaches its fullest expression in Isaiah, in chapter 42, which says, I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I have taken you by the hand and kept you. I have given you as a covenant to the people, a light to the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison those who sit in darkness. Just as God set the Israelites free to become the people of God, so too will they, the people of God, reveal to others who God is and set the prisoners free. They will become the light to the nations that quite directly shows to these nations who God is. This is God's big idea to make a people that will make him known to the world. And maybe that doesn't sound like a big enough idea to you, but we weren't consulted. And in these latter days, God has given us his only son, Jesus, so that we might be truly in relationship with God. Through him, all of the strangers can come to be part of God's people. And Jesus told us, you are the light of the world, A city built on a hill cannot be hid. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. And we think, well, this, this isn't the way it's supposed to work, right? People aren't supposed to look at us like we're supposed to direct them to God. And yet Jesus is saying, and this is not just an individual metaphor, the city on the hill. Jesus says, when people see you, see your life, they will give glory to God. This is what Jesus says. Because they see us, they will see the truth. The church, the body of Christ, is meant to embody the living Christ so that the world will see and know him. And we look around and we think, really? Um, but, but yes. One of the things we say about ANCL is that we are a community of hope for the world. It's very simple. It's not a slogan, perhaps, that sets the heart racing. You don't hear that and think, I'm I'm ready to go out and change the world. And yet, it is a perfectly succinct formulation of what God wants from us. Not just faith and love, but also hope. We offer people the hope of the gospel by telling them, yes, but also we show them the gospel by creating a community in which people can come and experience the living God, where they can experience the gospel, the good news, and be drawn into it. The church is a place where those who have been beaten down by the world, whose spirits are crushed who have given up hope, can come and experience, however imperfectly, that there is indeed reason to hope. We can lift them up. We can't solve their problems. But we can lift people up. And the church is also a place where the hard-hearted cynic can discover that there's something here that can't be explained away so easily. We can't answer every question. And yet there ought to be something here that is palpably different. It's a place where they can discover that uh, and escape their self-enclosure. That they can discover that true freedom is not in submitting to all of your own desires and making yourself your own little God, but actually of uh, submitting to the God who created us, to discovering that this God has a, a plan, a love, and that despair can finally be overcome by hope. And what this means is, uh, well, we need to be hopeful people. 
And often Christians can be not so hopeful people, right? They can look around at the world and just think about how terrible everything is. And well, God can't do anything about that. If we don't have hope, how do we expect other people to have hope? We need to be hopeful. And as we look around, it's not always easy. There are a lot of things that are wrong. It doesn't mean we just are naive and close our eyes. Um, but if this God we believe in, uh, who has done these things for is Israelites, did these things in Christ, and we believe will do also for us, if this is all true, then we have reason to hope, and that is a hope worth sharing. Let us pray. God, we thank you that, uh, that you have given us reason to hope. And you have told us that hope does not disappoint because your love has been poured out for us in Christ Jesus. We pray that you make us people for whom that is true, that we would be filled with hope, that we would have our eyes wide open to all that is broken in the world, all the ways in which the kingdom still needs to come on earth as it is in heaven, and yet remain hopeful, filled with hope, knowing that you are indeed the God who uh, makes all things new. And we pray that we would be a light to the nations. That doesn't mean we're, we're perfect. It's not on any one of us to do that. It's on all of us together to be your body to make you known. May it be so in this church and indeed in all churches, in all of your church, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.